Today we are joined by a very special guest on Hurdy Gurdy World, Fred Altensee. <laughs> Fred is a former police officer, has also worked on the election board there in the state of Florida. He's an accomplished author with several books to his credit as far as writing them, and also is a Hurdy Gurdy player. He has earned a special place in our heart because he runs the Ultra Wind Hurdy Gurdy Players Forum. Welcome to Hurdy Gurdy World, Fred. Thank you, George. It's very good to be here. Um, so I have to tell you, we have a little nickname for you in the wood shop. You do. <laughs> we do. Um, okay. The guys and I often refer to you as a little shorthand there as Florida Fred. <laughs> okay. Um, Mint in good fun, of course. Uh, everybody in the woodshop keeps up with you and what you're doing to promote the community around the hurdy gurdy. So thank well, you. Very cool. Yeah. And of course, I could say the guys in the woodshop are a little jealous too that I'm doing the interview today. So there we go. Well, you know, down, down here in the drum circles of that, they call me Sven the Friendly Viking. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How fun. Um, many lives, many nicknames, right? So let's start with uh, some Thank questions. You. Whatever you like. What drew you into the hurdy gurdy in the first place? How did you get started with it? Okay, what drew me in? <clears throat> many, many years ago, um, well, there, there were two things that drew me in. Many years ago, uh, Richie Blackmore and his group Blackmore's Night was down here and they, they did a, a, a show in Orlando. And of course, uh, Richie Blackmore is one of the absolute, in the pantheon of great guitarists. And uh, after Deep Purple and Rainbow, Blackmore's Night, uh, very much more acoustic medieval type music and it's wonderful. And so it's, I, I love it. So we went to see, see them and um, half the crowd was dressed up in like, you know, Ren Faire outfits and that. And I didn't have any, so I, you know, I had wore a black t-shirt. I thought that was close enough. I couldn't, I couldn't find an old deep purple shirt. I, I must have been lost in, in the wash somewhere. But at any rate, at the beginning of the show, uh, I don't remember the, the man's name, uh, a German man opened for them and he played Hurdy Gurdy for about 20 or 30 minutes as a warm up for the show. And I was just absolutely mesmerized. I, I had never heard anything like it. And just the, the drone and the melodies and, and, uh, it was like hearkening back to another time and it was just absolutely wonderful. And that really sparked my interest in it. And then, uh, a few years later after that, um, one of my favorite bands, the greatest German pagan band ever fawn, uh, was looking at one of their old videos. Yeah. And uh, their uh, second lineup uh, featured uh, Elizabeth Paute, hope I'm not mispronouncing the name, um, absolutely beautiful woman with an incredible voice. And she had left the group and studies uh, Spanish medieval song, uh, vocal techniques and stuff. She's exceptionally accomplished. But at any rate, at that time, they uh, watched a video of uh, Egil's Saga. And uh, in that video, she has the beautiful dreadlocks and the costumes, and she's playing hurdy gurdy in them. And I was absolutely mesmerized, watched it over and over. And, uh, you know, I kind of thought to myself, uh, well, I don't know how Erica would feel about me trying to get her imported over here to the house. Probably wouldn't go over well. So I thought maybe I should look into getting a hurdy gurdy. And that, that really sparked it for me. Now, Vikings and hurdy gurdies, that doesn't seem like a real obvious match. Culturally. Yeah, yeah, you're you're probably right. <laughs> so would you get them on a raid? Well, yeah, I mean, we we relieve people, we uh, you know, help people um, we unburden them of their possessions that are probably making them too materialistic and not in touch with their more ethereal spiritual side. <laughs> so you're talking about Blackmore's <laughs> Night. I'm personally a huge fan of them. Uh, their singer's got a terrific voice, and uh, Richie Blackmore has always been a yep. favorite musician. From yeah, yeah, they don't make it to the West Coast too often, so totally jealous that you got to see them. I think I think they're more I think they're more of an East Coast type thing, and I know they do a lot in Europe, of course, with COVID and that all that's shut down. But uh, I think they did Fairy Fest a couple times out there, you know, some of those things. But 
uh, probably not not recently. Uh, it's it's been a little while, but that that was probably probably twelve years ago, at least ten twelve years ago. That's that's been a long time for that that we saw them, and it was absolutely fantastic. And uh, Candace Knight was amazing. The band was great, and Richie was just unbelievable guitarist. Now, when I stalk them on YouTube, and I hope everyone who watches this takes the time to do that, Richie plays Richie Blackmore plays Hurdy Gurdy during their live shows. Did he play when you saw him? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, um, what is the song? Um, Fires at Midnight, I think, or one of those songs. He plays the opening to it, and it's beautiful. And he's he's bending the strings and stuff like you know he he has it sitting on a stand. And he comes over and da 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 with his guitar, and then he gets it going. And yeah, he he did play. He did. Yeah, in fact, he did play that, and it was absolutely mesmerizing. It's like oh my gosh, you know. And you're thinking, how talented is this guy? You know, of course, his ear he could he could hear or play anything. I'm sure. So, marvelous. Um, so now when you come to the hurdy gurdy. I see on your YouTube channel that you have a background in other instruments as well. Absolutely. But what instruments did you play before the Gertie? What was your journey? In terms of music, uh, um, I play a lot of different instruments. I started playing guitar when I was about 15. I'm 60 now. I, I probably look at least 59 and three quarters, you know, so <laughs> due to clean living and healthy thoughts. Uh, take a quarter year off of that <laughs> but uh I, I played uh played guitar um uh piano to degree keyboards uh, uh african drums djembe dunes uh banjo mandolin ukulele i just started playing ukulele a lot of stringed instruments i can play yeah uh, that's quite a background uh, the hurdy gurdy has a bit of a different learning curve compared to those other instruments. Of course, everyone comes to it through their own way and has a different experience with what that learning curve is. Uh, let's talk about that with you. You know, when you were first starting out on the hurdy gurdy, what was that learning curve like for you? Well, I forgot to mention one thing. I also play harmonium, and that has a bellow that you squeeze with one hand while you're doing the keyboard with the other. Sure. So I, I didn't have a huge learning curve as far as turning the wheel at the same time as playing notes. Uh, but uh, along with my uh, overwhelming Viking presence, uh, I have a strong Germanic DNA or a little bit Irish. So the, the, the first thing that, that was the learning curve is when you sent me the first hurdy gurdy, uh, and that was five years ago, February of 2016. So I got it. I thought, oh my God, this is the most beautiful instrument I've ever seen. And I got it out and, and it played and sounded just magnificently right out of the box. And, uh, but I opened up, I opened up the, the, the chest. I thought, oh my goodness, all these things are crooked. They must have, they must have slipped during shipping. So I very methodically and painstakingly straightened all the, the, the tangents all the, way, all the way up and down the board. And amazingly enough, when I started playing again, it sounded nothing like it did before. <laughs> so it, took, it took me uh, some time to get them back where they were. Uh, but I think to answer your question, um, and to finish out that, the other part, uh, I do read music, but um, painfully slowly. So I... I, I listen to stuff by ear and I figure it out and I'll, I'll do it on one instrument and transpose it if it's in a different key to the others. But I would think like most people getting into it uh, and 90%, even today when I find stuff, it's like, my gosh, what, it's just not sounding right today. It comes back to the cotton and the rosin. It comes back to the setup. It comes back to making sure the tangents, you know, cause being in Florida, even with the metal ones, uh, if they don't hit together, synchronize, you know, it give you some variances. But I probably ran into the same um, issues as most people with cotton and rosin. It's like, oh, my gosh, what's that horrible wobbly sound? What have I done to it? And I close it up and set it down. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, my God, I broke it, you know. And I will, I will say this also uh, for anybody listening that before, during, and after, uh, 
getting the hurdy gurdy from you and a second one as well uh, been nothing short of just spectacular as far as being helpful and accessible and very down to earth and just wonderful to deal with and, and we've become good friends so this is this it's it's a wonderful thing to me but as far as that initial curve i think just getting the doggone thing set up uh, is is ninety percent of the challenge, even even today. Uh, well, first, thank you for the kind comments. I appreciate that. Totally unsolicited, though, but uh, very very grateful for them. Well, I, I mean them. I I, I I mean I mean that very sincerely. Well, thank you. You know, as a builder of hurdy gurdies, we get calls from new players who need a little coaching sometimes. Uh, everybody watches the rock stars on YouTube who are just cranking away and pressing buttons. And that doesn't really convey a sense of the behind the scenes stuff that, you know, we all kind of dance with, with the instrument to keep it sounding its best. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, you get, you get that. Um, they, there's a little more. Of right. A and also curve. being in Florida where the humidity uh, is, is a challenge at different times. Um, you know, it, it can, there's just days where if I'm outside at the park or a show or whatever, it's like, it's not going to quite do what I want it to do. So I might turn a string off or do something like that and kind of make some adjustments, but they are, you know, and I will say, I consider your instruments to be very well made, very well crafted. But again, this isn't a Casio keyboard. You just plug in and say, okay, it's always in tune and I'm off and I'm running. That's, that's not quite the case. So you do have to, you do have to learn some patience with it, you know. And when I was when I was 25, I might have gone, "Oh my gosh, I can't do this," but I will note, and you know, because we have, you know, I've I've got the group going, and and I appreciate your contributions on that. And a lot of the times, people are going, "Oh my gosh, it's just this, this, and this." And what it comes down to is a little bit of setup, maybe. Um, uh, you know, adjusting the strings on the wheel just a little bit and shimming them a little bit here and there, and and you're off and running. You just kind of have to, you kind of have to assess where, where you're at with the instrument at that time and what's going on with it. But I've yeah. played it, I've played it in 100 degree weather, and I took it camping in the 30s and 40s, and played a bunch of War Druna songs up in the Georgia mountains, and uh, had a great time with it. And people came by to listen to it; they were just amazed. I mean. Like I always say, uh, I was playing it down at the park the other day, and a guy stopped. We had a wonderful chat, and you know, I play different stuff. It's like, well, I could sit there and play Hotel California all day on the guitar. It's like, oh yeah, that's like the nine hundred thirty thousandth time I've heard that. That's cool, dude. It's like, but if you're playing that, they're going, what is that instrument? And people will stop and take pictures and videos, and and I encourage it, and I think it's fantastic. Yeah, you know, there's there's so much novelty with a hurdy gurdy compared to other instruments. And when my wife and I perform out a bit, as, as you know, Fred, we'll play around regionally here. And, you know, if I'm playing something like the harp, for instance, or the mandolin, it doesn't matter how well prepared I am and how much effort I've put into the piece. If Anne Wynn comes out with her hurdy-gurdy and just plays something like even just tuning up, she immediately upstages whatever <laughs> I've got going on. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. There's, they're certainly amazing instruments. Let's talk about your repertoire a little bit. Yeah, and it's well, it, it, and you, you talk about that novelty. <clears throat> I mean, I like to think of it as bringing people's ears back to something they might have heard centuries ago. <clears throat> and the cool thing about the instrument is, and I, I throw uh, Erica, my wife, who you, who you know, uh, I throw her off because I'll start playing one thing, flip here, there, and you know. Because, I mean, you, you can go from, you know, a very old Scandinavian tune, hundreds of years old, and if uh, I go on YouTube and I look at my videos I have out, I mean, Iron Man is the biggest hit of all, which is really kind of funny to play a Black Sabbath on a hurdy-gritty. Yeah. But somehow it kind of works, you know. So it's kind of cool to do that. So this wide range, and I will also say that uh, – with the uh, flammable Babylon percussion ensemble, which I'm part of and one of the people in, as well as our group Whirl, uh, which is kind of a world fusion group, it, it I've played and, and performed with the Hurdy Gurdy and lots of different shows and venues and settings, and 
unfailingly people will come up and say that is just a beautiful instrument it sounded so great and they want to take a picture of it and who made it so well my friend george leverett from ultra wind music had flipped up the case you know so i've gotten great feedback uh from from the from fellow musicians performers but uh people really do like the sound they're intrigued by it and i, I think that's fantastic because again uh, it's an instrument that was dying out at one point you know and it was resurrected thankfully because i think it's a sound the world needs to hear and if if you gave all the world leaders a hurdy-gurdy they would spend so much time adjusting it being finicky over it and learning to play it they wouldn't be arguing with anything they'd be trying to help each other out yes. a new way to world peace through hurdy-gurdy one crank at a time one crank at a time <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about your practice routine a little bit. When you sit down at the hurdy gurdy, what is what does that look like with you, Fred? You know, when you're having some quiet time with the instrument, where do you take it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I like to play. Um, I, I I play a lot of Orduno on it. A lot of Wardrunas music. I'll play that, and I've got uh, probably about four or five of their songs that I'll that I'll run through. Hel Helvengen, Fehu, various ones, uh, and just you know, just because it's like a familiar pattern, and then get get the dog in it and do these things, and just like set tunes that I know, and I'll get kind of get my fingers warmed up and get kind of the feel of it and see where I'm at, and and I will mention I'm so happy to be playing George because. Uh, I had some physical challenges last year, and one of which was I had a torn rotator cuff, and I couldn't play for several months. Right. I, I didn't have use of my arm. So I'm very happy to be uh, more cranky in one area and less cranky in others probably that I can play again. But I would say, yeah, the uh, uh, Fawn, Wardruna, uh, Head and Garma, uh, all these, all these uh, uh, Highland, all these bands. I, I've liked to play a lot of that music. Wow, wonderful! Um, you play out in several different uh, stylistic kind of uh, presentations. I, I see on your social media. Uh, do you have favorite pieces or a style that the audience responds to a little more? Oh, uh, hmm. Well, a lot of the times they'll they'll hear it and they say that's from the Vikings TV show. I said, yeah, it is. You want to hear more of that? Yeah, but uh, I'll do that. And also, uh, Garmana, uh, Emma Hardelin, uh the vocalist in that, they have some fantastic music. And one of my personal favorites, if I want to play something really beautiful, and I'm going to mispronounce it, is Tucson to Core, which means a thousand thanks. It's it's a very very old melody and it's it's just a gorgeous song, and you know you tell them it's uh, and it means a thousand thanks. It's it's a love song, but if, if they knew the actual lyrics of it, what basically happened is the guy leaves the woman with like five kids, and she's basically saying a thousand thanks, you you jerk. I hope you fall off an ice cliff and get eaten by crows and dogs and freeze to death, which is the actual lyrics, kind of lyrics of the song. So, it's, but it's a beautiful melody. So I just tell them it's a love song. <laughs> so, so yeah, it sounds like a, a lot of real cheerful songs. <laughs> and 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 also also uh, one that actually one that people particularly like. Uh, uh, it's an old it's an old song. Uh, Sinead O'Connor did a version of it. I'm stretch at your grave. Oh yeah. Which is which is based on an old poem. People very much like that. It's beautiful because it starts out very slow and funeral funeral if i can pronounce it correctly tonight and then it picks up you know so it, it's it's a lot of fun that was one of our best ones that people seem to really like when we performed with it as well because it had because the, the instrument as you well know is not celtic it, it's not but it, but it sounds wonderful on those type of songs oh yeah those drones they sell it um so your wife, Erica, I see sometimes you'll play with her dancing. Does she perform with you much as well? How yeah, I give her a little cup and a hat like the, the monkeys used to. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Tra- dangerous yeah. ground. <laughs> she's in the other room. Uh, no, she, she, uh, yeah, she, she will dance depending on depending upon the venue and what's going on. But she's a very accomplished belly dancer, and her troupe uh, was formerly Florida Tribal Dance that she's in, and it's Wild Garden Belly Dance now in Central Florida, and she performs with that. And we, we kind of co-perform with them at various times. Hopefully, when everything opens back up, but absolutely, it suits belly dancers very well. Yeah. Awesome. You know, uh, a year ago, we had a great pleasure of having you and Erica visit us down here in Oregon. It was wonderful. And we almost got you down in that river in January. Well, you know, George, not soon after that, I had congestive heart failure. So <laughs> it's good you did. My money just floated down the river and Erica would have had to, turn, would have had to return to the rental car herself. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's hindsight 2020, right? <laughs> but I will tell you, I was, that was that water was seriously cold and it was very active. Yeah. Uh, with all that, it was great to have y'all visit us. It was wonderful. And, you know, we certainly would love to get down to Florida and have family that way. So love to pop in I on would you guys. Love to have you. Thanks. So let's talk about your books. You are an author and have released several books today. Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Well, uh, I went to. Uh, American um, AM, AMU, American Military, American Public University system. And I graduated in uh, 2014 with my master's in history. And I was the outstanding graduate student. Uh, and the school graciously auto trained us up to DC. And we had a fantastic graduation of that. But my master's thesis was on the uh, Orlando, Florida civil rights movement. And out of that, uh, with with you know some some more work and a little tweaking here and there, I've got three books published on on the uh, Orlando Civil Rights Movement, and the last one came out last Jan- uh, July, and uh, they're in the downtown library and a few other places, and uh, they're they've been picked up in a lot of academic circles as, as a good reference. And one of the nice things about it is that. Uh, it has all the links to it, but also the latest book has the actual transcripts of the interviews that I did with some of these people. So it's, it's, you know, primary source things. This is, this is what this person said. And there's, there's some fascinating history. And as, as I, you know, uh, my son and I, I'm teaching Harrison how to drive. So we're going to the cemetery to drive around where there's not too much traffic unless they're having a service. But we're looking at the graves, the graves and that. And I tell him, don't look at the parents, look at the grandparents. Our great grandparents were alive during the Civil War. Their grandparents were alive at the birth of the country. I mean, so the timeline is not that long. And I I think that the overriding theme of what happened in Orlando, which was unique in comparison to places like St. Augustine, Tallahassee, Birmingham, when there was an extreme amount of violence during the civil rights era, is that grudgingly, at different points, people came together, worked together, established communication for a common goal, and they furthered and bettered the society in which they lived. And I think that is a message that still has merit today, that we need to find a way to communicate and address real problems and issues that still exist in our country and let our country live up to the wonderful ideals that it has and continue to move forward. That, that's my personal opinion. But the, uh, the theme is that it works because they work together, they communicated, they cooperated, and they found common ground. And I, and I think that's the wonderful basis for anything. It's, um, it's, it's a nice insight into the evolution of our country culturally and all the things that, you know, we're, we're still playing out kind of today in, yes. in the media. Uh, so tell us how to get your books. Thank you, George, for asking. I truly appreciate it. Well, just if they, if they uh, search, if they Google my name, Fred Altensee, or go on Amazon, they're on several places, but <clears throat> pardon me, Amazon... Uh, does carry all the books as well as some of the other outlets and if they wanted a signed copy from me they could get a hold of me on facebook and i'd be happy to to set that up for them 
I've got a few left. I'm enjoying my signed copies. I'm, I'm so glad you do, George. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Uh, one thing I like about your books is that although your focus is kind of on Florida, you definitely have a broader field of view. Um, you, you reference some places I, I grew up around in North Carolina. Yes. Yeah, very relatable. Well, and, and, that's, and that's part of the <clears throat> parameters of the thesis is that it's, it's a case study. So to do that, you compare it with other areas and, <clears throat> you know, you kind of con make some contrasting things that happen. But did you, did you learn things from it? I, I learned a lot. Um, you know, the 60s were a little before my time, just, just a smidge. And it was a great insight into what was going on in my neck of the woods. It was, it was 1952 to 1971. Right. 1952 is the year that the Orlando Police Department hired their first African-American police officers. So that, that was, and that really was a gateway into the power structure for the African-American community into Orlando because that brought about, uh, you know, African-American lifeguards, bus drivers, firefighters, all of these things that they were excluded from doing. They could not. So it, it was, they really saw that as an opportunity uh, to gain entrance into the power structure. And, you know, those police officers, um, they were, it was an interesting phase because they couldn't arrest a, a white person and they could only work what we call the Paramore District, the, the black section of Orlando at that time. They had no powers outside of it. So it was quite a long time coming, but it was a very pivotal first step. And so we marked that. And then, you know, 1971 was kind of the end of that era. And uh, there were uh, some Orlando City Council people who were African-American. It, there were, there was, it, was it was moving into another phase. But when you do history, when you do those things, you know, the 19th century, well, you know, a lot happened in 1900, 1901. It wasn't just the 1800s. I mean, it does, you don't just flip a switch. So in other words, 2020 was a very pivotal year in our country, but it's not as if everything's 2021 and there's a reset. We're still dealing with things from last year and the years before and you know the decades before that will continue to influence what happens in our country and around the world but uh, it, it's it's a fascinating time and uh, i will always applaud the people who stood up for those rights at that time uh, it took a tremendous amount of courage to fight to fight a system that was structured against them and to work within the system ultimately to bring about the changes. You know, we, we take for granted the availability of information and the internet and how easy it is to connect and coordinate these days. But it was, it was just such a different world pre-internet and that, you know, if you rounded up a group of people to go have a protest and to, to make a demonstration and you had no idea what to expect, the wall of, of force and resistance. It was literally so many unknowns, whereas today we can kind of get a sense of it through social media. It, it really, great acts of courage. You know, can, it is. Can I add one thing to that? Uh, <clears throat> and one of, the, one of the hallmarks of that era was, say, like the public schools, the education, is everything was second, third hand. It, you know, it would be used in the white schools and ultimately make its way down to the black schools and the textbooks would be out of date and old and this and that. And I, I, can, I can attest that because when I was in Norfolk, Virginia in 1973, I was a kid, uh, I, I, was, I was bused. I went to Liberty Middle School, and the school had one or two slide projectors, radiators on the walls that didn't work, and the oldest books I think I'd ever seen. <laughs> you know, these books were so old and so outdated. Uh, but kind of in, in keeping with the other theme, the teachers were exceptionally engaged and interested in all the students, including me, in them learning and, and really propelling them forward uh, to overcome those obstacles. Wow. 
Well, this is such great stuff. I think we're going to wrap it up. Thanks, Fred, for everything you do, all the light you shine, and, and bringing community get together and, and facilitating the Thank culture you, of the Hurdy Gurdy. Uh, Thanks for all you do. And George, I want to say thank you and, and Edwin so much uh, for your wonderful instruments and your support of, of people in the community as well, whether they are altar wind people or not. You, you go out of your way to, to try to help people and, and uh, really just lend a kind ear and a helpful ear and a very experienced ear to what's going on. And, uh, it, it always amazes me when, when stuff comes up because I've been playing for five years and I've probably run into a lot of the issues people have over time. And uh, you have a way of saying, oh, do this, this, and this, kind of getting calling right to the heart of the matter. And the person comes back, oh, my gosh, George, thank you so much. That fix it is perfect. Well, thank you. There's a lot to love about these instruments, and we certainly try. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up. Hey, Great to talk to you. Let's do this again soon. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. And I'm so glad you reached out to me. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.